ان الحمد لله وحده الصلاه والسلام على من لا نبي بعده وبعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا الا ما علمتنا انك انت العليم الحكيم and so this is the, the another discussion that uh, iman uh, the the sum of the commission of some of the ba- bad deeds it affects the reward of the good deeds so salah prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as salat imadu din salah is a pillar of islam is a foundation of islam faman aqamaha faqad aqama ad-din whoever establishes it he established the deen faman hadamaha faqad hadama ad-din and whoever destroys it he destroyed the deen so salah in deen in islam is that of the head in the body so without the salah without the head we cannot say he is a human being so without the salah just no, i'm not talking about in legal sense in legal terminology in legal, legal aspect in true spiritual aspect if there is no salah there is no ima <laughs> a person ceases to be a muslim in this aspect that that how come he show his because it's quite obvious the person who does not perform the salah will be definitely negligent in his zakah in his fasting and in his uh, performing the hajj so salah is very important however there are two aspects of salah one the legal part second the part of ihsan legal part is we have to perform the salah at the prescribed times that's the legal part and the first thing which a person shall be asked for on the day of judgment awwal ma yuhasabu bihi al-abd yawm al-qiyamah as-salah prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the first thing among the huququllah among the rights of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first thing which a person will be asked about is salah how uh, uh, regarding the huququl ibad our rights of the people the first decision will be taken about the qatil maqtul about the innocent deaths so salah is as-salatu prophet said as-salatu nur salah is a light means which makes a person to see the things in right perspective which help a person to stay away from the prohibitions which encourage a person to get closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the salah as i said there's one one is legal part and legal part is that it has to be performed a minimum obligations has to be performed then the higher form is it is a salah which takes a person to close it close and close to Allah that is the optional part of the salah supplementary form of salah there's a sahih hadith in sahih al bukhari imam bukhari mentions allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this hadith qudsi prophet allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya taqarrabu ilayya abdi bin nawafil my servant draws closer to me through nawafil through the supplementary and optional prayers because obligation is law it has to be maintained but one's love and devotion to allah is reflected through the supplementary prayers imam ahmad rahimahullah during the great fitna great trial when the mu'tazila had the full influence at the at the official level and the full caliphate was under their influence the khalifa was also under the influence of the mu'tazila and there is the issue that quran is on the word of allah it is makhluq and there was the one dom- indomitable scholar that was Imam Ahmad rahimahullah who stood like a rock against this fitna then he also suffered a lot of tortures for this he was lashed and whipped all every day then his whole back was bleeding still in the jail in the prison he was performing 300 rak'ah of salah then he would cry and he would say to ayya allah is because of my weakness of body i cannot perform more it is just only 300 i can perform Now for we people it is sometimes we we cast a doubt about how is it possible then then we try to calculate the things the minutes to record okay to record for this much minutes and then together oh it's all hours together that then how could he learn and how could he teach the people it's actually 
we believe in the contraction and expansion of time, what Einstein says, theory of relativity, <laughs> that's about the time. If the time is expanded, it's also shrinked. It's expanded and it's also condensed. So expansion of time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expand the time for the for, for, for these pious people. And even now we can see the we can see the scholars, we can see the people. When we see the con their contribution, it's quite baffling and astonishing that a person thinks that a person needs at least 200 or 300 years for this work. But when we see Imam an nawawi rahimahullah, just he, he, he died in his 40s, just 45 or 47 he passed away. But when we see his contribution, it seems that the man, uh, he lived for two or three centuries. That it was only possible for him to make such contribution when he had the, he had the life for, for two or three centuries. But when we see actual age, just 47, 45, 47. Actually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the barakah in the time of these people. So Imam Ahmad, he, he would cry before Allah, Ya Allah, I cannot perform more because of, the, because of my weakness of the body. So, and Uwais Qarni, rahimahullah, it's mentioned about him that he would, it would take him, he would start his qiyam one night, whole night in the qiyam. The next night, the whole night in the raku. The next following night, the whole night in the sujood. Actually, when, when the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is found in the heart, then a person derives the pleasure out of these things. For we people, people like me, we, we start salah. Okay, if, if, if anybody comes to visit, how much it, it takes you? Just few minutes. I'll finish just in a jiffy. Then, Allahu Akbar, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That's our salah, the salah, the people like me. But these people, they derive the pleasure. When they are standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know that they are in front of the master of the universe. The one who created each and everything and whose pleasure is our objective. So they derive the pleasure out of these things. Uh, one of the Sahabi, he returned after a long period of time. If I'm not mistaken, Abdullah bin Amr bin Asr And his wife was waiting for him because he had been... Uh, for a long period of time, he was in jihad. Then he returned back after a long period of time. After the Isha, he reached home. And his wife was quite, now she was so much enthusiastic and too much passionate now to talk to her husband all, 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 all along the night. After the Isha, the, uh, when they, 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 the husband saw the permission that he wants to perform two rakat of the Salah. And he start out of the Salah, whole night in the Salah. And the wife is waiting beside. And before the Fajr, when he finished the Turak of the Salah, then wife, she complained, don't you have any right upon me? Don't I deserve any right? And he, he, he apologized. He said, Wallahi, when I started my Salah, then I was lost in the Salah. There is a top level of the Salah. One is the legal part, Starting with Takbir of Tahreem, ending up with the Salam. Whatever we think or whatever we do, so as long as we perform the obligations in the Salah, it's, it's, we are absolved. There's the obligatory part. But the second is the Ihsan part. And ta'bud Allah ka'annaka tarah. That you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see Him. Fa'illam takun tarah, fa'innahu yarak. If you're not able to see Him, at least you must have this feeling that Allah is watching over you. So do we have this feeling in our salah when we say Allahu Akbar? Hatim Asam Rahimahullah. Somebody asked him, how do you perform salah? He says, when I do ablution, I, I always think that it's my last ablution of life. When he washes his parts of body, he has the feeling that it's the last time he's going to wash it. Then I stand and I uh, it's the, my, my intention is that it's, it's the last takbir of the tahrim in my life. Then it's to say Allahu Akbar. Then I feel and I believe that I'm in front of Allah on the sirat, the bridge we are, we, we are supposed to cross. Then I all have the feeling that Jannah is on my right side, Jahannam on the left. Angel of death is behind me and in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this feeling, I perform the salah. 
and then I have the full hope with Allah that He will accept it. But I'm also fearful of my sins that Allah may reject it. So in between hope and fear, I finish my salah. He asked him, since how long have you been performing this type of salah? He said, for the past 40 years, I have been performing the salah. I always say that if we get just two rakah in our whole life like this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive all our sins. So we need to improve our salah. We need to make it the salah so that we reach to the level in the salah ta tanha'in al wal munkar. Indeed, the prayers, the salah, it prevents a person from obscenity and from all sorts of evil. The, so, so, and there are many ahadiths in virtue and excellence of the uh, uh, salah. So one of the hadiths is uh, Prophet sallallahu ta'ala that uh, when the, the hadith is when when the zuhar adhan is being pronounced when the zuhar call is being pronounced for the salah angel, one of the angels he proclaims and he says to the people O oh, those who have ignited the fire of Jahannam due to their sins get up and extinguish the fire of Jahannam by performing the zuhar salah and the people of Iman, people of Deen, they get up, they perform the Zuhar. Prophet says, so once a person performs the Zuhar, all his sins, since morning until the Zuhar, are washed away. Then at the time of Asar, angel again, he calls, O oh, those who have performed the sins from Zuhar to Asar, get up and extinguish the fire of the Jahannam, which you have ignited, which you have ignited through, through, through your bad deeds. Then, the, the people, they get up, they perform the Asar. All their sins from Zohar to Asar are washed away. And then from Asar to Maghrib and Maghrib to Isha and Isha to Fajr. So it means that those who perform five type prayers, all their sins are washed away. And not only this, when we do the ablution, Prophet Sallallahu the sins within the nails are washed away. Under the nostrils, under the eyelids, they are all washed away. That's why Isbaqul Wudu, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has encouraged the Ummah to perform the Wudu, to, to perform the ablution perfectly, not in a haste. And we should have firm belief while we wash our hands that the, the, the sins of my hands have been washed away, forgiven. When we wash our mouth, nose and all parts of body, that time we must have, because there is a hadith in which Prophet mentioned this Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that this Wudu, it, it, it erases the sins of a person. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a tawfiq to perform the salah the way it deserves to be performed. Though we are too much deficient and negligent, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem. He is generous enough. So we ask Him that so that we perform the salah, that the salah becomes a source of pleasing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A source of getting pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it is the salah, as I said, which determines the direction of the heart of a person. But the salah, it should be according to the... Uh, uh, two, two levels have to be maintained. One, the legal part, and second, the part of ihsan. But this cannot be achieved in a jiffy. Slowly, 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 slowly. And we try to just improve our salah try to focus upon the salah, what we recite in salah, having the full realization that I'm in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked, Izni wa awjiz, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he give me nasiha, you advise me, but be precise, a short nasiha. Izni wa awjiz, give me a short nasiha. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, salli salata mawaddi'in. In, when you perform salah, you have this feeling and realization that is last and final prayer of mine. It's my last and final prayer. You imagine when we have this feeling, when we perform the salah, before we perform the salah, we have this realization that it's, la, it's my last and final prayer. Definitely it will have the impact upon a person. And this, this will not be the salah that of mine, that of the people like me, that when we start our salah, we don't know in some times what surah I recited. Or we are, if we are with the jama'ah, we don't know what surah Imam recited. 
So we are lost in our thought. But still we should be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that at least He allows our entry in His, in His court in front of Him. However, we need to improve ourselves. The basic objective behind the sessions of knowledge and all these things, seeking the path of knowledge, what is the basic objective? To, to get the closeness of Allah. To practice what we learn. If we don't practice what we learn, then it will be, wallahi, a proof against us, not in favor of us. So, as salatu nur this will enlighten all our life. وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَغِرْ عَلَيْهَا لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَى And there's a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who perform the salah regularly, sincerely, Allah will increase their rizqi. Their provisions will be increased. Allah will put the barakah in their rizqi. Allah says in Surah Al-Taha, وَعَمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ O Prophet Wasallam, you command your family of the salah. You command your family of the salah. وَأَمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَةِ وَاسْتَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا And be firm and regular on, on your part as well. لَا نَسْأَلُكَ رِزْقَى We don't ask the risky from you. نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكْ We are going to provide the risky to you. Your job is to perform the ibadah. You do what is up to you. What is due upon you. And I will do what is due upon me. Allah has taken the responsibility of the risky. But I always say there are, there are two things. Need and greed. Need Allah will definitely fulfill. But greed, there are, there are no limits to the greed. Wastabir alayha. So you be firm and regular upon it. La nas'aluka rizqa. We don't ask the risky from you. Nahnu narzukuk. We are going to provide the risky to you, the provisions to you. Wal aqibatu lit taqwa. And the best culmination is that of taqwa. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here also that we, when we perform the salah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill our needs. But the salah, it should be up to the mark. But let me repeat it again, that we cannot have that type of salah in a jiffy, overnight. We have to work hard for this. Especially performing more and more nafal prayers. Whenever we find the time, perform the nafal prayer, op optional prayers. Well, performing the optional prayers, try to just focus upon what we are reciting. Even though we don't know the meanings, but at least what we recite and the feeling that I'm in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm in front of the master of the universe, creator of this universe, cherisher of the universe, sustainer of the universe. This feeling must be full in the heart. Then we can see the change. Definitely, wallahi, when we focus upon the salah, our life will be changed. Even if sometimes there are certain bad habits, we want to get it off, but still we cannot. But the best way to get it off all our bad habits is a salah. Because it, uh, we can say, reconstructs the thought of a person. So besides the salah, there's also zakah. And zakah, if you see the hierarchy, iman, without iman, no action will be accepted. And it is immensely important for a person. There are certain important things in one's life. Like we need the we have the life supporting system. Without the water, our life is difficult. But for some time, without the water, we can still survive. If we, if, if we cannot get the water for one day or two days, still we can survive. So it means our dependence of water is important, but not totally dependent on water. That without it, without which we cannot survive. So wherever we go, we find the water. Tremendous amount of water is, and even in the uh, the researchers say that the only one percent of the total amount of the water is is being harnessed. Only one percent. The rest of the ninety nine percent is yet to be harnessed. So this one percent is enough to fulfill our needs. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala made our life dependent on the water but we can still survive for some time without the water more important than water is it is air without the air we cannot survive that's why it is just closed our nose for water we have to extend the hand we have to move from here and there so because to move here and there to to search for the water we have the capability to, to survive until we reach to the source of the water 
But as far as the air is concerned, it's not the thing that we can survive in absence of for, for some time. So that's why Allah has put it closed to our nose. That's it. Because our life is totally dependent on this. Yet still, we can hold the breath for a few seconds or for many people for a few minutes. And what is more important than the air? More important than the air is Iman. That's in the heart itself. That's in the heart. Because if a person misses the Iman, loses the Iman for a while, for a jiffy, and he passes away in that very moment, he's all destroyed together. So Iman, it gives both to the Amal. Specifically, the first one is Salah. And then after the Salah, there is Zakah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَآتُوا zakah." Mostly in the Quran, where Allah mentions Aqimu Salah, you establish the prayers, you perform the Salah. There Allah mentions Wa'atu Zakah. You also pay the Zakah. However, Zakah, Zakah system is actually is to, is to maintain the social order and to maintain the social classes. In a society, there are many classes. And these classes are important. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that I have made you into different classes. So that you may subjugate one another and the subjugation is important for the smooth function of, functioning of the society. You imagine if there are people of equal standard, then the, the, the society will collapse. So this interdependence of the classes within the society is important for the smooth functioning of the society. However, there's also an element of exploitation in these classes. That's why Karl Marx, when he saw this exploitation, that how rich people are exploiting the poor people, so his own philosophy came into being, dialectical materialism, which is famously known as dialectical materialism. Now he sought the, the, the uh, removal of all classes in the society. He wanted that the, all the, the, it is a class class-based society, there's a root of all exploitation. So we need to have a classless society where there is no rich, there is no poor, all are rendered equal. Apparently it seems to be a very catchy and very attractive slogan, but it is all against the human nature, all against the human reason, because classes are important in the society. And for this, millions of the people were killed to bring a revolution on these lines. It was 17th October 1917 when the revolution came, which is also known as October Revolution. The revolution was to have the classless society. But practically it's not possible. It collapses. The revolution starts in 1917 and collapsed. The whole spectrum of revolutions collapsed in 1989 with the collapse of USSR. <coughs> <coughs> so the idea is to have a classless society. Riches are exploiting the poor, so there should be no exploitation. But this cannot this cannot be achieved. The classes in the society is they are indispensable for the smooth functioning of the society. That's what Quran says. However, Quran teaches class management. Those who, whom Allah bless with the riches, they are commanded. There's obligation upon them that they have to assist their uh, their their, uh, their fellows their fellow Muslims, they have to assist them monetarily. And when they assist them, they should not express their favor against them. Rather, it's a, it's a form of ibadah, which has to be done only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. While assisting the brothers or sisters, they have to keep in mind that they have to be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them to be in a position to be of any help to, 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 to their brothers and sisters. Sheikh Maududi Rahimahullah, Abu Ala Maududi, one of the most in influential Muslim scholars uh, in, the, in the 20th century. He says that uh, I wish Karl Marx would have come, would have known the idea of zakah system in Islam. Then he was not required to bring such a great revolution. What is zakah? The, what is the philosophy of zakah? One of the hadith says, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
is taken from the rich and given to the poor, but not to express their favor as a means of ibadah, as a means of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So zakah is, I'm sure, wallahi, if, if the Muslims who, who ought to pay the zakah, they pay the zakah in its due, due course, in due amount, then to a larger extent, the poverty in the Muslim world will be eradicated. One of the goals, sustainable development goals with the United Nations is eradication of the poverty. But with the existing capitalist system, capitalist society, it is not possible because the capitalism is meant for, for this system. Rich gets richer, poor gets poorer. And even all the universities, colleges, they are meant to create the fodder for their industries. And nothing else is a, is a mess and whole, is a, is a full mechanism now involved in the exploitation of the, of the people. So within, within this existing capitalist system, is def definitely impossible to eradicate the uh, to er eradicate the poverty. However, if zakah system is placed well in the society, but unfortunately many people they they think when it is the time of zakah, say a person is supposed to pay hundred thousand, he just pay five thousand, six thousand, and gives to the poor, and he and he thinks he's absolved of this responsibility. No, it has to be calculated well. S even single penny has to be paid because it is ibadah. If a person performs a salah and he doesn't perform the two sujood, he performs one sujood only. If a person perform, doesn't, doesn't perform the ruku, his, his salah is all deficient and not acceptable. Same applies to the zakah. Each and everything has to be ensured. There must be a one accountant who will calculate all the things. Then it is an ibadah. Then this ibadah will be a source of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then fasting in the month of Ramadan. Prophet Jannatun. Fasting is a shield. And fasting, when we see it's <laughs> Imam Qurtubi says Rahimullah, Asaw Musurun by Nal Abdi Warabbi. Fasting is a secret between the servant and his Lord. Salah, yes, people can see it. Zakah, second party is involved. Hajj, it is all evident and manifest. But as far as the fasting is concerned, is a secret. Whether the person truly observed the fast or not, who knows this? The person and his Lord and no one else can know about it. No one can know about it. So it's a sir, it's a secret between a person and his Lord. And fasting is actually to develop our self-control so that we get the strength how to control our nafs. And there are many hikmah behind the fasting. Inshallah, some other day we discuss it. We are going to discuss the fasting also in one of the hadiths which is going to come. So fasting is, and uh, the objective of fasting is a person, so that a person gets the taqwa, he achieves the taqwa. And uh, it is through the fasting. Fasting actually, in our modern, in our modern life, in the modern era, you see, two things are dominant. Though not, uh, Muslim world is still uh, a bit protected. But yes, we are falling on the now. We are trying to just follow the same path. Two things are dominant. As if our life is meant for belly. Means all our efforts to get more and more wealth. All our efforts to get more and more wealth. And what's objective? To have a beautiful and blissful life. As if we are living for our belly and nothing else. You see the whole spectrum of our activities. As if you are living only for the belly, stomach, to satiate the stomach. That's why the word carrier and all these things, uh, uh, what do you call, the job security and all other things, it is all just to secure the belly, to, to secure the stomach. And the fasting is a proclamation that I am not the slave of the stomach, as, of, that, as that of the Marxists. Their revolution is meant for this thing. Life is above the stomach. Yes, it is one of the requirements in our life. But it's not the only thing we are created for, we are meant for. And then, sexual needs. It's one of the human needs, we cannot deny it. But it's not the only need we are created for. Like the Freudian concept. Marxian concept. Marxian concept is economic interpretation of life. As if our whole activity is meant for the stomach. And Freudian concept as if our life is meant for the sex and nothing else. Though it is one element in our life, 
but life is far above such things. And thus fasting is a proclamation. I am neither the slave of my stomach nor of my sex. I am slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because a person abstains voluntarily, intentionally abstains from these two things. And then the lastly, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَحَجُّ الْبَيْتِ And Hajjul Bayt, making pilgrimage to Makkah. Hajj is, is uh, we can say that, is, is a roof of Islam. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept the Hajj of those who have performed so far and bless and grant the tawfiq to those who haven't performed so far and make us amongst such people whose Hajj Allah will, ex- whom, whose hajj Allah will accept or Allah has accepted. So Hajj is Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever has the capability to perform the Hajj. Because for Hajj, there is one requirement that a person must have the wealth, enough wealth, which he requires for the journey. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever has the capability to perform the Hajj but still doesn't perform the Hajj, he has the choice whether to die as a Christian or as a Jew. He is at liberty to choose between the two deaths, to, to die as a Christian or as a, as a Jew. And I was thinking on this hadith, actually, Yahud and Nasara, they were connected to the Hajj because it is Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam who built the Kaaba. And it is Ibrahim alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجْ O Ibrahim, now you call the people to perform the Hajj. And it was all a barren desert. He said, Ya Allah, whom I call? There is no, no one. He said, you just give a call. And it's our responsibility to bring with the people. From all the distant paths, they'll come to this place. So or around 4,000 years before Ibrahim, والسلام, he made a call. And that call is still being responded. However, Yehud and Nasara, they neglected this call. Actually, this call is call of Tawheed. Hajj is, is a call of Tawheed. That we leave everything behind. Our social relationships, our job, our business, our wealth, our house, our neighborhood, our, our friends, everything we leave behind. And we go there to prove that I am here only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To prove our loyalty to Allah. To prove our sincerity to Allah. Yahud and Nasara, they neglected, they avoided this thing. So if any of the Ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa any of the followers of the Prophet doesn't perform the Hajj, so he's always, he also follows the path of the Yehud and Nasara. That's why Prophet he has a choice whether to die as a Yehudi or a Nasrani. He has a choice whether to die as a Christian or as a Jew. So these are the five pillars of Islam. It's a basic structure of Islam without which a person cannot get the success. However, uh, then there are optional prayers. There is one of the hadiths which we are going to study. Uh, there we, we we have to compare this hadith with those with, with the other hadiths uh, uh, in which other ahkam are mentioned and they are given immense importance. So then we need to understand the primary structure and the secondary structure of Islam. So there we discuss what is the primary structure and what is the sec- secondary structure. Subhanallah wa hamdihi subhanak allahumma wa bihamdik ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh